Welcome to the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability Podcast Series. Today we're in Ohio and we have the opportunity to visit with Pastor Brian Kunkler. Hey Brian. Hey Aaron. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to get this tour with you at your place and uh, there's so many amazing things we're going to be sharing with you folks. Um, where we are here, just outside of Akron, Ohio, is Brian's home and he and his wife Megan uh, have created a permaculture food forest here over the course of about seven years but really more like four or five because the first couple years were cleaning up and fixing things up and so this place is called 31 Gardens and uh, it's, it's just a tremendous treasure and my hope is that many of you in our network, in our Why on Earth community, in our audience will be inspired to do more in your own home and place uh, by this podcast episode with Brian. So let me just tell you a little about Brian's background. He is a pastor at Garden City Church, and he has a degree in elementary education, as well as a master's in religion from the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School outside of Chicago. As I mentioned, he and his wife, Megan, uh, are here at this beautiful forested home property where they are also accompanied by their five children who range in ages from 3 to 13. This is 3.7 acres, and uh, what's happening is, is an absolute gem, an absolute treasure. And I'm so excited, Brian, given your, your background in religion and theology and, and spirituality and history, there's a very deep sense of meaning and purpose and import mm -hmm. behind what you're doing here. And so uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us on the show. I'm so excited that we get to visit with you today. My pleasure to have you guys here. Well, let me just give one quick shout out to Marite Ball before we get rolling. She's behind the camera I wouldn't say manning the camera, I guess womaning the camera for us as we do the tour. And Marite, hi Marite. Hi, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. Uh, Marite, as many of you know, is one of our most active Why on Earth ambassadors. And she is also a member of our recently formed Global Advisory Board. And Marite connected us with Brian. So a big shout out and thanks. Uh, merci, Marite. Yeah. <laughs> so Brian, how did you come to be here and, and come to do what you're doing here? Wow, yeah, so I guess you, you say it all, it all starts with a seed. Everything starts with a seed. So I think I was in second grade, a uh, teacher in class gave everybody a little corn kernel to go home and to plant, and uh, I did. And I planted it in the side yard at my parents' house, my house, and an entire summer went by of me every single day walking out to just look at it and to see it. And I was amazed and awed by this thing that came out of nowhere and just shot up out of the ground. And it never even became a full mature kernel of corn, but I didn't care. That was the coolest kernel of corn I'd ever seen in my life. And then it kind of lay dormant from there uh, for years and years. Didn't do anything with it because I didn't have the opportunity to uh, until we bought our first house in South Akron. Tenth of an acre, city lot, nothing special about it, um, but it was mine and I could do what I wanted with it. And so after we bought in December, when spring thawed, uh, I found myself in the backyard with a shovel and I was digging up grass. And that, that began the journey of me starting to walk out this thing that looking back, was it was in me. It just never had the opportunity to come out. And we, we transformed that one tenth, one tenth of an acre city lot into... Uh, the mini food forest, gardens in the back, we had rabbits that we raised, and really everything that we did on that tenth of an acre is we're doing the same things here, it's just a lot larger scale. And so there's more to do, but it's a lot more fun too. Oh, absolutely, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Well, and right behind us, we have a very special type of plant here, don't we? Can you we tell do. us about this one? Yeah, this is uh, African amaranth. So I'm a pastor, and uh, we had some African immigrants that came to our church, and one day she said, Pastor Brian, and she presented me a Ziploc bag of seed and said, would you please plant some of this for us? We have no place to plant it, and it's a reminder of home. And so I, right around here, I sprinkled some of these seeds two years ago, and uh, for two years, they they keep coming back. And we love it so much that we, we spread it all over the place. So there's African amaranth and Akron, Ohio coming up all over. It's absolutely beautiful. And as, as you'll see, 
there are all kinds, a, a whole variety of, of fruit trees, of other food plants, growing roots, all kinds of different food plants, and uh, even medicinal herbs and culinary herbs growing throughout this landscape. So uh, we, we can uh, take a tour, and Brian, uh, if you would, uh, yeah. show us around. Yeah, let's go. Let's start walking. So in permaculture circles, uh, things are broken down according to zones. And so this is zone number one. This is the kitchen garden. This is the place where you want to walk out the back door and if you need a tomato, you grab a tomato. If you need oregano, it, it's all here and it's not a far walk away. So this, uh, this is the kitchen garden and we grow lots of stuff here. This is obviously just really good soil. Most of our compost comes in here and uh, lots of things. So send the kids out, hey, go get this, go get that, and dinner happens. So kitchen garden right here. This, uh, obviously, this is where the kids hang out. Actually, the kids are everywhere. But this is, uh, this is kid land, so you'll probably find boots and shoes and all sorts of things. Um, here, this is, uh, right now, this was inspired by uh, The Greatest Showman, the movie, which was a big thing in my family. So all this stuff came as a result of that. But uh, my vision for this in the future is this is going to be uh, an aquaponics uh, location. So the water will come in here, we'll collect it off the roof, siphon it in, and then uh, right on the other side of this wall is our garage. But it's not a garage, it's a greenhouse. And so that's where we'll grow the plants that will filter the water and then recirculate it. Uh, so that's what's going to be happening right here. So maybe just to, to embellish on that a little bit, aquaponics, just to break that down a bit further, it's a system using water where you'll basically have a pond in here, right? Yep. And uh, you'll have all kinds of plants basically growing with roots in the water. Is that part of what you'll be doing? Yeah, so we'll pump the water up into the grow beds. And then the great thing about plants is that they uptake nutrients to grow. So all the fish waste, and then we actually have ducks and geese. So that waste will get siphoned up in the water. The plants will act as a biofilter, and then the water returns clean. So the plants get the nutrients from the fish and the ducks and uh, they return it as clean water to the fish and the ducks. And then you're also a able to harvest the fish as you like from time to time? Yep, harvest the fish, harvest yep. the plants. Yep, yep. absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. Yep. Cool. Can't wait to see that. Yeah. I, I talked with the kids earlier about how excited they are to be able to swing into the water here too. Oh, they're so pumped. Yeah. Looks like they're already a step ahead of you on yeah. that. Yeah. So we're gonna go deeper. The kids are gonna swim here too. That's part yeah. of the that's part of the deal. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. It's not off limits to kids. They want to get in. Well, in in permaculture, we talk about layering functions yep. uh, when we're thinking in the physical uh, stories, all the way to the tallest trees, down to the uh, ground cover, everything in between. Well, you're layering functions here now for the kids to have their play, their entertainment, yep. and meanwhile they're in a living uh, classroom environment basically. Yeah, fun has to be one of our stacked functions in just about everything we do, so. Love it, Yeah, fun, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're starting to move back into kind of the zones that are a little away from the house, and uh, so the further away you get, the bigger the, bigger the plants get. This uh, has been our chicken pen and um, most recently pigs. Now the, the geese and the ducks are occupying it. But uh, obviously we have put uh, tons of wood chips, uh, leaves, all sorts of things in here to kind of be the place where the, the animals would unload and we'd be able to capture all those nutrients. So this soil in here is probably the best soil on the property, maybe the best soil in Summit County. This is really good stuff in here. So I wanted to plant, we planted fruit trees and berry bushes in here in rows. And uh, these are just one year old. This, this is the first year that they've been planted. And so, um, so this will be off limits to pigs from now on because they would obviously tear it up. But uh, this is now an extension of the food forest that's back here. What, what kind of uh, fruit trees do you have planted in here? Uh, I've got some Asian pears, uh, a lot oh, of apple, peaches. And pear, yeah, pear, apple, peach. Yep. Yep. Well, let me ask something. So you've mentioned the soil. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for the work we're doing around stewardship, sustainability, soil is essential. Yep. Many in our Y on Earth community know that through soil building, we have the opportunity to collaborate with the living biosphere yep. and sequester carbon. This Absolutely. is how we reverse climate change. Yep. You know, soil 
carbon uh, an increase worldwide of 10% is equivalent to sequestering all the fossil carbon we've released since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So what you're doing right here is helping reverse climate change. And I know with your background that you've given a lot of thought to soil and what this means for the arc of our human journey as seen through the Judeo-Christian view. And yep. I'm, I'm wondering if you yep. might share a bit with, with us about that. It's so, yeah. so beautiful. And yeah, so Genesis, Genesis 2, uh, God creates humanity out of the ground, Adam, the Hebrew word for soil. So we, we have a, it's not a tangential relationship, it's a direct relationship with the ground. We were made to rule over it, to cultivate it, to steward it with wisdom and care and grace and kindness, right? Which we don't do, which is why so many things are out of balance in our culture. But, uh, but I, I believe, um, and I get to experience and practice it here, that uh, part of our core vocational calling as people is to tend to the earth out of which we were brought. And, uh, and where that doesn't happen, it's not good for people, it's not good for ground, it's not good for anything else, but where it happens well, I think everybody wins. So yeah, soil, it all starts with soil here. And uh, from there, either it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Beautiful. Well, I know a lot of the folks in, uh, you might call it a more conventional Judeo-Christian view, can end up sort of thinking of the the natural, the imminent, the physical world is actually sometimes even uh, evil or yep. associated with evil. Yep. And I, I think that that is perhaps the... The, the most dangerous, the most uh, painful, the, the, the most destructive uh, element in, in Western culture. Oh, it's terrible. And yeah. what you're describing is a very different understanding. It is a, a wholly different understanding. I tell, I tell people, uh, church people all the time, I speak to Christians week, all the time I talk to Christians and I love to do that. I don't think we understand how often our worldview is not based on what God said, but based on what the Greeks said. Mm. So the Greek philosophers, uh, what, what is good is the soul, is the spirit, what is, what is evil is matter, right? Anything that's physical mm. is thereby, it has to be contaminated. Mm. And sometimes as Christians, we take things into our thinking that we don't even know where it came from, but we assume we know where it came from, mm. right? Matter as corrupt, that's a Greek philosophy that's a greek philosophical construct mm. in in the bible I, I just want to be so clear with people god uh is the creator he made this right. and he and he didn't make it poorly he made it beautifully he made it abundant he made it vibrant he made right he could have made food to be something that we stick into our veins and just ingest nutrients no he made it delicious <laughs> and he made it varied right God has an idea of creation that is beautiful and rich. But we but as Christians because we don't read Genesis 1 and 2 mm. because we miss the formation of what God's thoughts are about this. Mm. And then we miss that, so we miss so much of the story. We miss miss so much of our calling, mm. so much of our God-given vocation we don't walk in because we don't read the beginning of the story and understand it deeply. But we also don't understand the end of the story. Where, and this is what I teach Christians, that God is going to come back and, and make all things new again. Mm. And that doesn't happen in heaven. Mm. It's not we're disembodied souls on clouds of ethereal spirit something, right? The, the we, geese are saying amen. That's right. Amen. They're, they're, they're I'm preaching to the choir here. They get it. Right? So our, 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 our destiny in the future is a restored creation uh, yes. where we have new bodies mm. and where we're not... Uh, having to walk in all the dysfunction and the nastiness that we walk in now. We believe God's made provision in Jesus to take care of that. But anyway, the whole story is we were brought from the ground, we were made to steward and tend to the ground, and we will live in creation forever. And this is a story that Christians by and large don't see because we, we more so are, are formed by Greek philosophy mm. and we read the Bible through that lens. Yes. It's not God's lens. Mm. And so that's why uh, apologies, right, for the evangelical Christians who are good hearted, but don't understand so many things mm. Mm. and they don't know why they don't understand it. Yeah, it's well, you know, right now, this time we're living in, as so many of us know and are engaged in, we have 
brothers and sisters worldwide by the thousands, by the millions, being impacted by pollution and poison, being impacted yeah. by our climate crisis, being impacted by all manner of environmental systems that have gotten out of whack because of our lack of care as human beings. Yep. And I love, especially in many of the faith communities, the incredible, beautiful focus and call around the social justice, the environmental justice issues and working with yep. refugees from many parts of the world who are being, they're, they're on the front line of yep. many of these situations. And to be frank, a lot of us in the United States in our communities, in our neighborhoods, we're not experiencing the immediacy of a lot of these changes and challenges that so many of of, of God's human family is experiencing right now. Yeah. And so there's a profound ethical uh, question that arises in all this too. And I love the great news is that we can all engage in this yeah. work, engage in the kind of vision, worldview, and understanding that you're articulating. We can do that right now today. Yep, absolutely. That's, that's the work we're supposed to be doing. It's good work. Love it. Yep. Love it. Yep. Well, what do you say? Should we continue yeah, on the, keep, on the journey? Yep. Cool. I think it's interesting. So we, uh, we miss out on the present issues that so many people are facing. But what, what we also don't see is, is the future issues that we're creating Yes. for the people that we do see, right? So I've got five kids. I've got a vested interest in the future long after I'm gone. So um, there's present issues and there's future issues and both of which we have to really start thinking about. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So, uh, so back here we move into the food forest where uh, we do it in rows. Um, we've got rows of fruit trees and berry bushes of varying age and in between uh, we rotationally graze and move animals in succession. So we don't want to have them on there too long because they would do damage, but we want to have them on there long enough to, to do their function. So we'll, let's go see some pigs back here. As we're walking, I'm just going to mention to our audience that as you can see, if you're viewing the video, we're moving in and out of very bright sunlight. And here we are. This is the reality of the gorgeous day today that we're enjoying. And, uh, so, you know, apologies for the quality of video being affected by the light. On the other hand, it's such a joy to be able to share this delightful walk with you all that we're having with, with Brian and with Marite. So, uh, of course, those of you who are listening to the podcast, you can imagine this however you like. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's uh, just a beautiful opportunity to see everything you're, you're creating here, Brian. Yeah, thanks. So here, these, this is... Uh our present tillers, these are the ones that we're moving uh, once, sometimes twice a day, but at least once a day to a fresh piece of ground and they uh, eat everything in their path and then stomp on the rest and incorporate it into the soil. And obviously you're seeing that we're walking on a bed of hay here. Uh, there's all sorts of green materials out there uh, that are available for the picking up. Soil doesn't want to be left naked. So we follow in their wake with, uh, this is, we've got hay here and pretty soon we'll have leaves. Yeah. But uh, everything we do intentionally is designed to build soil and to, and to make it better. So we've got what is, you could call it a, a pig tractor and, and probably uh, I've, I've visited a lot of different farms and projects over the years that use chicken tractors as a way to es essentially have those birds rotationally graze through and work yep. through the land. And, and this is the first time I've seen a, a pig tractor with these two lovely sows doing yep. their thing. So uh, yep. could you just describe, because some of our audience may not really be familiar, describe how, how you're working this and how, how, like, how many people does it take to move it? How do you do that? Yeah, well, so th this was not designed with uh, an ease of move in mind. <laughs> I had extra materials around and I made use of it. So I move it. And uh, I will I will shimmy one side about two feet, and then I'll go shimmy the other side two feet. Okay. And I'll go back and forth. It takes me about a, a minute. Yeah. But uh, when we go on vacation, the ladies stay where they're at, and I have people come and feed them. But I, I would never ask anybody else to move this. Ah, uh, yeah. I wouldn't so do it's it. the uh, it's the two step shimmy, huh? It is. It All is. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this was originally a chicken tractor that uh, we did probably two to three years of chickens back here, and then now uh, this year it's pigs. And so as they're moving through the landscape, they're, they're working, they're eating down the foliage, yep. and they're also dropping their 
manure which is fertilizing the ground right absolutely yep and they and they also love to dig i mean it doesn't look like it but their snout is more like a shovel than anything else they love having their face in the ground and so they dig down and they actually uncover uh, seeds that are dormant in the soil yeah and so after them we'll get any number of different plants that come up that we hadn't seen before maybe it hadn't been here in years but they expose it and so wonderful uh, yeah so what pigs will do uh, in one day is a blessing now wh where you leave pigs for a long time yeah they'll actually destroy it right so mm -hmm. it's about managing it and knowing what their function is and then maximizing that and uh, so yep one day at a time they get a fresh piece of ground well, maybe we can uh, walk around and just get a close-up. It looks like one of one of the ladies is looking for some apples yep. right underneath there. Yeah, and this, this type of rotational grazing, managing for the beneficial effects on the, on the landscape and making sure they're not there so long that it's creating detriment, yep. this is one of the keys to our approach to regenerative agriculture and particularly with animal husbandry as a key to the soil building that we're doing all over the place. So uh, just beautiful to see yeah. this in action. Wait, it looks like the yellow jackets have moved in. Oh yeah. To the apples. <laughs> Look at that. telling you before so we, we don't buy any food in for the animals uh, what we have found is in the industrial food system there is so much waste yeah. that gets thrown out into landfills and with just a little bit of intentionality uh, we're intercepting that waste stream and turning it into soil and animals right? yeah. so we're building soil fertility essentially they're composting it for us and they get a great life and then as Mark Shepard in Wisconsin likes to say, they have one bad day. Right. But it's not even one bad day, it's the, the lights go out, right? It's very humane yeah. and ethical. Uh, but without animals, I don't know how we deal with all of that waste and right. actually convert it into uh, nourishing human products. So, you know, what you're doing here on this landscape with these creatures is a pattern we can all do every day. The, the composting of food waste is so critical. And when we let food waste go to landfill, right, it's decomposing in a contained environment that's creating anaerobic decomposition, meaning that there's not sufficient oxygen. What that does is release methane back through the landfills and back into the atmosphere Methane is a greenhouse gas 23 times as potent as carbon dioxide. CH4 is the uh, chemical uh, composition of the methane molecule. On the other hand, when we instead are composting the food waste, just picture when you're making a salad, chopping the ends of the carrots off or whatever it is, if you instead are putting that in your compost pile, not only are you not exacerbating the climate crisis, instead, you're contributing to the virtuous cycle of soil generation, which we know is one of the keys to sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So this is, you know, thinking about why on earth, a why, a fork in the road, this is perhaps one of the most potent examples of that daily choice we have in front of us. However meals a day we're, we're doing, three, whatever it is, there are so many times every day we can make that choice. And Absolutely. it's a really important one. Yep. Yeah, it's like throwing dollar bills out the window and we throw food away. It's, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a, so you move on? Yeah, let's Actually, do I, it. I see our, our beehive over here is a frenzy of activity. I oh. Think. Let's just go, we'll go look at them real quick. All right. So that, obviously that, uh, that was the pig last week. This is the week before. And then this is, uh, you can see in the in the pig food there were a couple uh, kernels of corn that didn't get eaten. So here here they come. They they're coming up behind us. Nice.
they just had their top two boxes removed, so they might not be happy about that. How long ago? Uh, about three days ago. Yeah. Yeah. So here's our pollinators. We've got all kinds of pollinators around here, but these are the ones that give us honey, so we like these guys the most. Yay, honeybees. Yes, love honeybees. So we think there's enough in there that we're probably going to have to split it in the spring. Yep. And then uh, have two, and we'll keep going from there. We're going to be leaving uh, Brian and Megan a copy of our uh, Celebrating Honeybees uh, children's book for the kids and a uh, copy of Celebrating Soil as well. So just great to see them. Mm. The busy bees. Yep. Yep. They're happy. All right. You going? Beautiful. Yep. So we're moving further and further away from the house, which means we spend less and less time out here. This is obviously a south sloping hill, and uh, we've terraced this with uh, trees, uh, lots of pine trees that were back here. Nothing wrong with pine trees, it's just um, we decided to use them as berms for a terrace to hold soil in place, and we planted uh, fruit trees, berry bushes, uh, all sorts of plants in, uh, in the terraces, and uh, so these, uh, trees are establishing. They're probably about four years old right now. And um, we've got some nurse trees. We've got um, locust, black locust trees that were native back here. And um, we, we continue to manage them and chop them down, bits and pieces of them every single year. And uh, so they provide nitrogen into the soil for the uh, to feed the fruit trees. And at some point this will be a canopy of fruit. The fruit trees will be the largest thing. and everything else will be uh, serving that purpose. So they're, so the locusts, they're a nitrogen fixer. They are a nitrogen right? fixer, yep. And uh, mm -hmm. in the permaculture s strategy or framework, we put nitrogen fixing trees throughout the landscape because yep. they're literally putting nitrogen into the yep. ground from the atmosphere. They're feeding everything else. Yep. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Now this almost looks like the way you've got the, the terraces using logs, it almost looks like a form of hugel culture, mm -hmm. right? Yep, it is. Yeah, it's part terrace, part hugel culture. Love it. Yep. So hugel culture is basically burying logs, twigs, branches, um, and creating very rich uh, environments of decomposition. So you're basically feeding all kinds of fungus, bacteria, etc., that is supercharging that that soil generation process, providing nutrients to whatever's growing around there. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, and these logs will hold water for a long time. So if it doesn't rain for a while, these trees will send their roots in, and they'll get nourish, they'll get moisture out of it. Um, even when the soil's depleted, so beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Got a little uh, blackberry thorn here, Marite. Yeah. I'll let you go. Go ahead. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that we want to do here is we obviously want a productive landscape. Um, and so we have fruit trees all over the place. And we, uh, we've learned how to graft fruit trees, which is a great way to propagate them uh, cheaply. But uh, I quoted him earlier, Mark Shepard, um, he's a farmer in Wisconsin, just a brilliant guy. But um, typically, so um, Apple trees are the kind of thing that if you want to know what you're getting from the tree, you have to plant that kind of apple tree. You have to graft onto it. And um, so typ typically when uh, you plant an apple seed in the ground, it's, it's not going to come up true to type. It's not going to give you the same kind of apple that you planted in the ground. It's going to be oftentimes lesser or uh, it's not going to be as good of an apple as you want it to be. And so Mark Shepard says, you know, if you play the percentages, if you plant an apple seed in the ground and it's and if it's going to be a lesser variety then don't plant those at all right 
don't don't waste your time well he turns that on its head and he says well no don't don't plant less of them just plant more of them because we want more varieties of apples we want to have different kinds that we've never seen before so one of the things that we do here is we plant all kinds of grafted fruit trees but we also plant all kinds of seedlings because we're experimenting we mm. want to see uh, what new things there might be that we haven't seen before that might actually uh, come up in the genetic lottery so a lot of these trees right around here they're seedlings that we planted and we don't know what kind of fruit they're going to give us it's kind of like rolling the dice uh, but we want to plant more of those and not less and so while we're planting these seedling trees we'll also be planting because now I know how to graft trees and mm -hmm. we'll plant grafted ones next to them so that we don't have to wait eight years to know that's not a good apple so we got to cut it down now let's plant the grafted one well that's that's a lot of years wasted mm. so we're going to put the grafted ones next to the seedlings let them all grow and then make our decisions on which ones we want to keep and which ones we want to get rid of do you have a favorite resource you've learned from in terms of how to graft uh there's a video by a guy on youtube and i think 200 people have seen it 200 <laughs> he, he's an older guy and it he doesn't have He's not putting his pushing his material out. Yeah, but it's I, good. I randomly found it, and that was the gateway for me. Yeah, to 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 learn how to graft. So, I read a ton of books, yeah. ton of videos. Yeah, some, it didn't click until I saw this okay. guy's video. So you get, you got that, everybody? There's a guy on YouTube. <laughs> no, just kidding. What we'll do uh, when we publish this is, if we can, we'll try yeah. to track down the link for that particular video and include that in the show notes. Yeah. So, uh, and if yeah, you find the uh, guy, thank him for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Great. Keep going. Yep. There's a log here. Okay. So Marite, there's a log right here that I'm stepping up on. Okay. So one of the things that we, lo we love to do is uh, we, we buy our food in the grocery store and there's a certain variety or amount of kinds of food in the grocery store, which is probably like 5% of what is available for us to eat. Probably actually even less, but like this plant right here is called a, a sea berry. And you talk about stacking functions. So this is a uh, it's also it's called a nutraceutical meaning there's yep. so many nutrients in there that it's like medicine uh, and it grows anywhere on poor soils in drought and it fixes nitrogen oh so it actually gosh. supports the soil structure it supports the plants that are around it so and that's a winner right there right so there's all sorts of things we've never heard of that uh, are available to us that do multiple levels of good things it, uh, so we try to bring in as so, many of those as possible. So with sea berry, um, how are you? Are you you're you're harvesting the berries? Are you eating the berries? Is that how you're getting them? Are you like just eating them by the handful, or putting them in the salad, or making a preserve, or what? What do you do with them? Well, so sea berries, uh, it takes a male and a female, and it takes uh, a handful of years actually to get fruit. Yeah. This is the one berry plant that I planted. I haven't seen fruit yet on it. Okay. So we've got some in various places around. Right. But with most of the fruits, like currants, gooseberries, aronia berries, blueberries, uh, we f we freeze. Yes. Yeah. We we've tried canning, and it's just a lot of work, and yeah. we're thinking we're losing a lot of nutrients in it. But right. we will freeze. Yeah. And then we uh, put into smoothies. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Nice. That sounds yeah. great. So and the kids will eat anything in the form of a smoothie. <laughs> right. That's a, a parent's uh, uh, secret knowledge right there. That's right. <laughs> All the neighbors dump their yard waste here, which is good. They bring their organic material to us. Oh, so that's nice. We'll take it. One side note while I'm thinking about it. So right here is a drainage ditch that the uh, local municipal folks built. There's a wetland uh, just uphill from here. It's about a five acre wetland and they uh, didn't want the water so they decided to dig the drainage ditch and, and get it out. Hmm. Typically 
what, what we what we do culturally with water is we want to move it through as quickly as possible. It's the, it's the absolute wrong thing to do. Mm. So like part of the reason why we do the terraces is because we want to capture that water. We want to slow it down and let it permeate deeper into the soil so we can keep it. Right. So we're building soil, increasing the organic content of it, which then allows it to hold more water. So when we slow the water down, we can actually keep it on site uh, for way longer. So if we do experience a drought or a, a period of no rain, well, we, we've held the rain in the soil. So don't don't get rid of water. Just slow it down and keep it, but figure out ways to keep it. You know, this is so important. And whether we're talking with friends in the arid west or other friends anywhere, places that are accustomed to quite a bit of rainfall. We were talking earlier before recording that you don't have to supplement with irrigation here generally. Not you get a all. lot of rainfall. However, with climate disruption, yep. we're going to sp- potentially very likely be seeing more and more drought events in in different parts of the world who are accustomed to the rainfall so this is a an essential strategy absolutely essential yep yep it's huge lovely day for a stroll it's a beautiful day in ohio yeah Now, have you seen different species of butterfly or bird show up as you've been increasing the biodiversity here? Yeah, so uh, tons of birds, um, lots of insects. What we, the interesting thing is we find a lot of frogs, toads, and snakes. Cool. Yeah. So the invertebrates, or uh, not invertebrates, but the, uh, these are the reptiles and amphibians basically, yeah. right? Yeah, so things that most times you don't see in your yard. Uh, we'll just be walking down. There's there's snakes uh, kind of working their way through the grass and um, beautiful. Yeah. So the, yeah, the bird population is increased significantly. You know, because, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of the uh, reptiles and amphibians have highly uh, porous skin, so they're really susceptible to environmental pollution. Yep. You're creating for them a safe haven here, right? That's it. Yep. That's it. That's so wonderful. So life wants structure to to come around it needs structure like you look at a city there's buildings there's houses right there we we inhabit structures and it's the same way with with life so we uh we bring in logs yeah. just because they're good yeah. because it's a structure yeah. right we plant perennial plants not annuals because below the soil they create structure right we're building buildings that nobody can see below so below the soil line, yeah. so that life can prolif- proliferate there. Like, yeah. So that, that we can have more life and not less. Right. So if life is like a pyramid, the more structure you have, the wider the base is going to be, and the more life that it can support on top of that. So that's why one of the reasons why um, we focus on perennials is because it allows life to thrive. Mm. Because life will surround structures if you're always cutting and tilling and breaking the structure up, you're cutting off the succession of life. And that's exactly what we're seeing with our um, conventional chemical-based monocropping of the main commodity crops, right? Yeah, oh, it's horrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah, the way forward, I, uh, we talk about sustainability and the planet and climate, all of these things. I think the chief way that most people interact with the created order is through food and what we eat. Yes. And so any way forward has to address how we're getting the food that we're getting. Yeah. And there's better ways to do it. It's uh, it's Amen not to it's, that. It's, it's not Amen. as efficient. It's not as efficient. It's not as easy, right? But efficiency and easy are not always the path forward. Right. Right. If efficiency and easy are destroying the thing, you have to find a new model. And so what we found is so right. It, let's say ten years from now. When our fruit trees are fully mature and we've got chickens and all sorts of things running around self-feeding, I'm not going to have to hop in a tractor and plant things and till things and herbicide things and fungicide. I'm not going to have to do any of those things because it's going to do it on its own. So what we found here is it's a lot of work in the beginning getting it set up, um, but as time goes on, it's less and less and less. And at one point, I won't have to bring in wood chips and leaves and soil building things because this will all be doing it unto itself right so sometimes we shy away from work we shy away away from a challenge but it's just the initial period that's hard 
once it gets established, uh, this is made to work on its own with just a little bit of massaging and tweaking, right? So a lot of work now, but it's going to pay for itself in a lot of years to come. I love this. It's it's like an ultimate conspiracy, right? And I love conspiracy because you're breathing with it's the mm. spiritus breathing with all these creatures in this landscape. Yep. Absolutely yep. beautiful. And I also on the on the comment about efficiency. You know, if we were to ask engineers, conventional engineers, whether trees are efficient or not, we might get the response trees are not very efficient, but they're highly effective. Mm. And they're doing so many things at once through their beingness, yeah. right? Yeah. And I love what the farmer philosopher Joel Salatin says. He says, uh, and he's doing all kinds of organic and regenerative mm. agriculture. He says, you know, if you think establishing these kinds of systems, if you think organic agriculture is expensive, have you priced cancer lately? Mm -hmm. And it's so important that we're making these connections. Yeah. We know uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I'm, oh gosh, blanking on the name. Farmer Footprint is the movie, 20-minute documentary we'll have on the website soon. And um, this is essential, connecting the dots between glyphosate in particular, uh, organic uh, chemicals, and the proliferation of cancer rights, particularly in the farming community and in the downstream communities, because these are water-soluble poisons, mm -hmm. uh, all the way through the Mississippi uh, watershed and elsewhere around the world. And... Um, it's, it's just essential that we stop the poisoning. Mm. Every day we're making decisions about what we're growing in our landscapes and the foods that we're buying and the beverages that we're buying, right? Absolutely. So we're either sending signals to do more of the poisons yep. or more of wh yep. what we can be doing yep. that's not poisoning. So any bit of water that will come off this property and we want it to come off as slowly as possible is going to be filtered through deep soil a, an abundance of plants that are at varying levels of root depth. Like the water is going to come off clean. Like we are not contributing to the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? right? In that, but we're also producing food. Yep. And you can do both. Love that, it. We would love for people to to kind of catch this. You can do both. So you had this urban yard, also a much yep. smaller piece of property where you've done this kind of work and. I just I want to emphasize for folks, regardless of the size of yep. the lot or, or, or place, the property, or even if you're in a high rise and you're connected to a community garden a block or two away, we can be doing this at every scale, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so uh, we live in Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio just spent a billion dollars. Actually, we didn't just spend. We will be spending for years a billion dollars to fix our sewer system hmm. because it's inundated with too much water, the EPA came in and said, you, we, you can't do this anymore, right? So the city is trying to figure out ways forward with water and what we do with it. So we, we spend a billion dollars on sewers. But in my yard, it was in South Akron, uh, I had a bunch of fruit trees and berry bushes that, um, that, that would, in a rain event, would soak up a whole lot more water than the yards right next to me that were just grass two and a half inch high grass doesn't soak up a ton of water, right? So even in city environments, uh, some of the solutions to some of our runoff water sewer problems is just putting perennials in the ground yes. and letting them do what they do. And they'll do it for us. I love it. Yeah, and Absolutely. there's other solutions that need to be done in conjunction with that, but don't forsake the easy ones. Right. Plant trees. Yeah. And if you're gonna plant trees, make them bear fruit, because fruit's good, and everybody <laughs> likes that, right? So. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. While we're walking, I'll just uh, mention, I did remember the doctor's name is Zach Bush. I had a moment there uh, many days on the road. I apologize. But yeah, Zach Bush uh, did a beautiful and very powerful 20 minute documentary called Farmer's Footprint. And my sense is by the time this episode's published, we'll probably have that video available on the Why on Earth uh, platform as well. But if not, you can just look up Farmer's Footprint, really important on the glyphosate agriculture cancer connection. Yeah, so we're down the hill here, lots of young trees. Uh, again, all sorts of fruit trees. We actually have uh, some chestnut trees, Chinese chestnuts are uh, resistant to the chestnut blight and uh, produce incredible uh, carbohydrate nuts, um, 
So yeah, this again in 10 years, this will be a food uh, canopy, but just, just getting going right now. So you were telling us earlier uh, that the chestnut, it's like having cereal crops growing on the tree and you don't have to fuss with any of the planting, tilling, harvesting, they're just dropping right off the tree and there Absolutely. you go. Yeah, the studies have shown that the uh, composition of a chestnut is similar to brown rice, uh, which means that you can plant a tree and actually the yields are comparable to uh, brown rice. Wow. So instead of doing all the year in and year out work that it would take someone to cultivate constantly a field of brown rice, you plant a tree and that tree gets bigger and you don't have to do anything to it other than harvest. I love it. That's what I like that. Yeah. I, I just want to harvest and <laughs> first, yeah, leave, leave the work to somebody else if they want to do it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we love, our kids love chestnuts. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Bushes. Haven't seen any yield on that yet, but we're hopeful that next year will be the year. Hazelnut, nice. So one of my favorite farmers is a guy by the name of Sepp Holzer. He's in Austria and uh, he farms, I think it's like a 120 acre farm that's on the side of a mountain. But one of his things is he says, uh, he says animals were created to do work and you just have to figure out what, ver what variety of work they were made to do. He says, so you can either have the animals to do that work or you can do the work yourself. So right in here, uh, we've got a bunch of blackberries that have kind of just taken over. And from varying you know, different points in time in the last three to four years, I have to get my machete and come in here and tear them down. And I can't keep up with it. It's just too crazy. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna bring our pigs in here in the spring and we're gonna release them to do what they love to do. And that is to clear blackberries and all other kinds of vegetation. So they will love doing it where I hate doing it and they will do it nonstop and I can do it in short spurts, right? They will do the work because they were made to do that work. And there's obviously some incredible yields that this will all be, all this underbrush will be taken care of. And then we can go in and plant fruit trees that won't be out competed with weeds after the pigs have left. All right, and then in different stages in the future, we'll bring them back, bring the pigs back in to do the same thing and then the fruit trees will then bear fruit that the pigs will be able to eat, right? So there's a, a whole bunch of good things that animals do that we're thankful that we've learned that they do and eager to put them to work. Mm. Love it, love it. Is that a big old oak tree you got up there? That is an oak tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah that other big one is a big hickory tree. We got a huge old apple tree that was, this was on the property obviously long before we came here. And uh, some of these apples, let's say, let's just break it down by percentage. Let's say 20% 20, 20 of these apples, we're, we're not tending to this at all, 20% will be perfect. They'll be store quality fruit that you can just eat. You don't even have to wash it. 20% um, will be rotten and wormy and nothing that you would ever want to buy in a store, right? But uh, and then in between, you'll have varying quality of apples. So the good ones we eat, because we want to eat them, because they're delicious. But everything else uh, is still used here, right? So the pigs are eating a ton of apples right now, feasting on... 
a five gallon bucket every single day. Uh -huh. They just love it. Wow. Uh, and so we're putting those nutrients into a place where they're enjoyed, they're, they're greatly enjoyed. Pigs love to eat them. But so, so the, here's the economics of it. So you go to a commercial orchard, 100% of their apples are store quality, right? And so if you look at that from an efficiency standpoint, you'd say, well, why wouldn't you want all of your apples to be perfect? Why would you waste uh, that potential income? Well, the, what nobody talks about is the costs that go into making 100% of those apples perfect. Mm. So there's a lot that you have to do. Pesticides, herbicides, um, there's a lot of inputs that have to come in that are not great for the environment. That's yeah. why the hypoxic zone exists. That's why our water quality is going down. That's why cancer, right, is on the way up. Yeah. Nobody talks about that very much. But the economics of it, and again, Mark Shepard in Wisconsin has been huge for me. He says uh, that he financially, because he doesn't bring inputs in, with what he's able to sell in terms of a perfect apple, and then what he's able to do with the less than perfect apples, he can turn into cider, he can make them into apple sauce, right? There's a market for them. He finds out that he actually comes out ahead of the commercial orchards, yeah. simply because he's not funding inputs to get 100% perfect apples. We don't need 100% perfect apples. Right. We just we need to make money as a farm, and we want our product to go to where it's enjoyed and will be used. Yeah. Right. So. Um, Wonderful message. Wonderful yeah. message. Well, let me uh, take a moment just to remind our audience. This is the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series. And today we are visiting on his farm with Pastor Brian Kunkler. Uh, this is 31 Gardens just outside of Akron, Ohio. And we have off camera one of our wonderful ambassadors and on our global advisory board, Marite Ball. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who are making all of this possible. And that includes Patagonia, Waylay Waters, the Lidge Family Foundation, Beauty Counter, Madera Outdoor, the International Society of Sustainability Professionals, the Association of Waldorf Schools of North America, and Equal Exchange. A, a huge thanks to all of you for supporting this work. And a very special thank you to everybody who has joined our monthly giving program uh, you are helping to make this podcast series possible you're also helping to make all of our community mobilization work possible all around the country and worldwide and if you haven't yet joined the monthly giving program and you would like to you can just go to why on earth why on earth.org click on the donate button or it's why on earth.org slash support and you can sign up at any level you like whatever works best for you uh, when you sign up, I will send you an email with a very special code that allows you to unlock unlimited copies of our ebook and audiobook resources. So you can share it with friends and family, colleagues, etc. So, a uh, huge thanks to all of our uh, monthly supporters and look forward to seeing you join if you haven't yet. That's very helpful to everything that we're doing. Now, I, I want to, under the wonderful shade of the tree here, I want to mention one of the things we were talking about earlier, the history with Johnny Appleseed. It's quite possible, we don't know exactly how old this tree is, but this could have been one of the trees that he planted uh, mm -hmm. many, many decades ago, well over a century ago. Yep. And uh, tell us a bit about that story, like what, what, what is all of that? Why were we planting apple trees? Yeah, well, so Johnny Appleseed was an interesting character. I, I love to hang out with him. Really cool guy, it seemed like. But um, he he had a passion for apples. Yeah, he. Uh, I mean, coming into the pioneer lands where there wasn't a whole lot of food available yet. I mean, there was in terms of wildlife, but he wanted to start cultivating and establishing um, human settlements. And so he was just faithful to serve humanity <laughs> by planting apple trees everywhere he went. Like what a what a selfless. What a selfless guy that he would, uh, and, and what a future-oriented individual, right? Because he wasn't going to benefit from those trees, most of them. He, right. he, but he was, he, was, uh, he was planting for the future, yeah. for blessing people that he would never even meet or interact with. And yeah, so uh, 
He's he's a legend in uh, in these parts in Ohio and Indiana. In terms of those of us that grow fruit, he's uh, he's an icon, and, and we love him. Now, one thing that Johnny Appleseed would not be excited about is that I do graft fruit trees, and to Johnny that was a, a no-no. It was tampering with the the natural God-made order. So, Johnny, I apologize. <laughs> I agree with you, but but I also want to graft a little bit too. So I love sometimes it. You gotta. Yeah. I love it. You know, and if anybody's interested, there's a beautiful. Uh, essay on uh, Johnny Appleseed and the apple in uh, Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire, just an exquisite piece. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Now I also, I also wanted to ask you about why the name 31 Gardens? Yep. What's with the number 31? Yeah, so Aaron, you know I'm a pastor and I spend my time shepherding a group of people and uh, one of the things that I, I, I continue to talk with uh, to them, talk about with them, is uh, is this idea in, in the book of Proverbs. It's uh, it's it's 31 chapters of what wisdom is. It's God telling us, right? There's a wise way to live, and there's a foolish way to live. And then the third category is actually the violent, right? But there's wise, there's the fool, there's the violent, and God wants us to be wise, right? And so there's 31 chapters of wisdom. And it's interesting in the book of Proverbs that uh, early on in the book, foolishness is personified as a harlot. We would say a prostitute, right? And so with, uh, foolishness looks like a prostitute. At the end of the book, um, Proverbs chapter 31, is the picture of wisdom incarnate in the form of a virtuous woman, right? And you read about this woman, and she's awesome, right? But it's the sum total of this, these wisdom qualities that are personified in this person. So we call this 31 Gardens because we want to create wisdom incarnate. We, 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 wisdom is not just something that runs around in people's heads. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be brought into real, right? We talked about the Greeks and matter and how they thought it was evil. No, we believe matter is, was created by God. Mm -hmm. He just wants us to order it well, mm -hmm. right? So... We want this to be a demonstration of wisdom that people will be able to walk around and see a different way. And they would say, wow, right? Wow, there is something about this. And they wouldn't be able to use this word, but they would see wisdom enacted all around them. And then our hope is we want to, we want to see other people, not that this is the only way to enact wisdom, but it is a way. Yeah. And we love to see a whole bunch more people doing this. So we call this 31 Gardens. And we believe that our task, our call here, is to grow people who grow food. Mm. My ultimate calling here is not just to grow food, although I have five kids, so I need to, right? I need to grow food for the sake of sustaining them. But we want to grow people who grow food because um, it's a joy to do so. When you're doing it the right way, it's work, but there's good work and there's bad work. There's mm. life-giving work and there's life-depleting work, right? And so we want to show people what life-giving work can be like and what it can produce for you it's good absolutely love this and uh just to cut the greeks a little slack you know they the, did say the, some the, good the things term, <laughs> the term sophia right means the the, the female uh, personification of wisdom yes right yep. so that's something we find there and also i'm struck that socrates said that wisdom necessarily leads to action love it which is what i hear you and see you embodying yep. here yeah love it yeah Good. Let me ask a little about your your congregation at um, at the Garden City Church. You were telling us a bit about it earlier. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear a little more about who who's there. What kind of people are are you? Yeah, working yeah. With? So so Garden City Church in uh, the near west side of Akron, Ohio. One of the things that one of the unique things. So this is a unique property. Our church is a unique church, and one of the things that we believe is that we are better. We're better when diverse peoples come together. So at our church, we're old, young, we're rich, poor, we're black, white, and everything in between, uh, young, old, left-leaning politically, right-leaning politically. Like, we want to be diverse as a unified body of people, right? And permaculture talks about this, that life happens at the edge, right? So there's different ecosystems, right? There's forest, there's grassland, there's water. But what we see in the natural world is that when the forest and the grassland meet, that's where life is the richest. Mm. It's where the water meets the grass, right? And where you have many ecosystems coming together, 
life just explodes, right? So I say to, I say to our people at church that uh, we want to experience the edge effect, that when old, young, rich, poor, black, white, left leaning, leaning and right leaning, right? We get out of our monocultures and we come together, that's where there's an explosion of new good things that couldn't happen otherwise. And so we believe that God created creation to be diversity and unity because it's magical. In the same way, we want to see human beings come together, diversity and unity, because when it happens, it's magical. So that's, that's what we're going for. What we're doing here on this property is what we're trying to do at our church on the near west side. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I'd love to visit sometime. Love to have you. Yeah, that'll be great. So, uh, hey, can we... Can we go grab some Jerusalem artichokes? Yes. We might have some yes. a stop along the way. Let's, but uh, well, let's, let's head up here. We'll yeah. grab some. So we're going to go up, we're going to check out some Jerusalem artichokes. Um, so part of my evolution as a, as, a, as, a, as a land owner is when I first got here, I only wanted to plant edibles. That's it. I didn't care about flowers. I didn't care about things being beautiful outside of the aesthetic of just the well-orderedness of it. But uh, as, as I've been here longer and as I've had two girls, uh, I, I've come to see that beauty is a, is a core requirement here too. So we've begun planting flowers of all kinds around. And one of the cool things I'll show you Jerusalem artichokes is that it's a flower, it's beautiful, and it's edible, right? So uh, Love we're gonna it. go check out one of the things that uh, is beautiful and it's edible, so everybody's happy with it. Say, say did, we, did we talk yet about the Nora apple? No, I can, sh I, I can show you, want me to show you? That'd bit. be great, okay. yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And there might actually still be some fruit on there. I don't know that oh, we yeah. harvested all of it. Some willows here? Yeah, so I have some willow trees down in the lower parts that I use as terraces. Yeah. And uh, willow yeah. wants to grow. So you, you lay down, look at it, this is just the, the branch of the willow tree that I laid down as a oh, terrace and then this tree yeah. grows out of it. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And cool. so this is great because it's obviously uh, capturing sunlight, turning it into carbon, and then when it gets too tall for the fruit trees, I just cut it down and It'll, it'll keep doing the same thing. Living crystals of atmosphere. Yeah. Carbon in particular. Yeah. Okay, so this is the Jerusalem artichoke here. This is, I just planted this guy in the fall. And uh, as is all of this. But they, they get to be five to eight feet tall, beautiful daisy-like flowers. Mm -hmm. And then, Marita, if you want to come on over here, we'll just... Actually, Aaron, you want to go yeah. pull, pull on some of those roots and you can just see you what comes up. On in here? Yep, yank on whatever you want to yank on. Let's Grab see. a cluster of them there. Yes, so we've got, look at these guys. So these are the edible roots, right? Yeah. Jer Jerusalem artichoke. Jerusalem artichoke, yeah. These are not nearly as big as the ones in the garden. Yeah, the garden ones are quite big, huh? Well, there's a couple that are decent size. Yeah, the best soil is in the garden. And so how do you prepare these? Uh, you can roast them, you can boil them, you can give like, them to the pigs. Like any tuber, right? <laughs> like any tuber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, how nice, how beautiful. Oh, yeah. Should we just leave these here for now? Uh, if wanna... you want to take some with you, you can take them. If you want to well, leave them, you can leave them. I'd grab a handful and share with my yeah. my mother and Bruce back, getting back to Colorado after a few weeks on the road. Yeah, I bought about a pound of those, mail order, and now I, I don't know how to speculate how many pounds of them I have on the yeah. property, but... They, uh, Abundant, huh? It was, it was a, uh, a wise purchase to get a pound of those, because they're... So that's, that's another thing folks could do in their yard of any size, just get some Jerusalem artichoke oh, absolutely. Going yep. Got some asparagus here. Oh, yeah. Talk about it, there's half the perfect apple. Yeah. So you can take that guy if you want to. Thank you. 
That's, that. a, that's a golden delicious right there. Beauty. There's a hawk flying overhead. Looks like, is that a hawk? Yeah. Lots of little creatures here for him to oh, yeah. keep his eye on. Okay, this is this is the Nora apple. Do you see the little garden here? Oh, this is uh, I allowed my daughters to have a, a garden and told them they could put it anywhere they wanted. So they hadn't learned permaculture principles yet, so they wanted it. They we're pretty far away from the house here, but this was Nora's garden. And one year Nora put an apple seed in there and it grew up and I didn't expect it to have uh, any quality fruit on it. Uh, let alone to bear, this is probably a four-year-old tree. Wow. And it, for, so, it, so, so this is a genetic anomaly. Huh. It, uh, it obviously is thriving here because plants on their own roots, planted where they're planted, do well than any other kind of plant. So it's a, it's a big, healthy tree. It fruits at a young age. The fruit is of large size, and typically the older the tree gets, the, the fruit will get a little bit bigger, and it actually tastes good. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a... Uh, this is a genetic um, slot machine that, that Nora hit a, she hit a winner here. So if you so ever see the Nora Apple advertised, you'll know this is where yeah. it came from. So your daughter Nora has that special touch, huh? She does have the special touch. That's great. Yeah. So I need That's to get great. her planting some more seeds. I see you've got a lot of comfrey here too. Yeah, again, comfrey, right. I, I probably bought a pound of it yeah. and I, it, I have it all over the place. Yeah. And we love it. Comfrey is one of the best faster crops for essentially uh, carbon sequestration and soil building in your landscape. So you, you can typically tell a permaculture uh, property by noticing a lot of comfrey growing. That's, that's kind of one of the core practices. Yep. So it's uh, yep. wonderful to see that. Yeah, yep. yep. Toby Hemingway, I think in uh, Gaia's garden, Jerusalem artichokes and comfrey were two of his big heavy hitters. And uh, I've, I've found that both are, he's right. He's right. They're okay. both great. Yeah. We've got uh, Marita, you might appreciate this. We got some figs here in, in Ohio. These guys got a late start, but uh, we're hopeful that we'll get some of these guys right before it gets too cold. Yeah, now these guys will die back every year above ground, but the roots below ground will stay alive and they send out new shoots every single year. This is our annual garden that uh, obviously is, we're not grass farmers, although we kind of are. The pigs were in here last, up until about May. Mm. And what I found is I left them in there too long. Mm. And so this beautiful soil that I had built, they, because I left them in there too long, uh, really kind of matted it down. Mm. So planted a bunch of fruit trees in here on the north side because obviously they won't shade. Um, let the grass grow up just to start fluffing the, the dirt up again. Mm -hmm. So next year we'll resume vegetable production here. Nice. Oh, we talk about sea berries. These are um, gumi berries. Huh. Again, beautiful tart fruit that, and it fixes nitrogen. Beautiful. And so propagating more can't find gummies for anything less than like $35 online. And so I'm propagating this one. I got a couple more plants over here that I'm propagating on this guy. But yeah, we love gummy berries here. So these are gummy, not gummy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Healthy. Yeah, they are healthy. Grapevines growing on the fence here. Oh, yeah. This is a, the aquaponics thing that we're building. This is where all the dirt goes. And then I'll probably actually plant these gummies right here, and then any nitrogen that wouldn't leach out, it would just go down to the other plants on the terrace. Beautiful. And then uh, volunteer tomatoes all up in the fence line there, so oh, help wow. yourself to I tomatoes. Try one of these. You, you missed grapes. These are Concord grapes, and they uh -huh. are delicious. Now I have some Concord grapes in, in the car from New York. I oh yeah? I love Concord grapes. Love them. Okay, where were we headed? I forget. Oh, well, we did the Jerusalem artichokes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe let's just uh, return to the yeah. zone one or, yeah. or uh, the front porch here. And 
Absolutely wonderful. Thanks so much for the tour. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, if you want to do a poll and see some real Jerusalem artichokes. So these are the... Yeah, the, these actually the fell over because they were so heavy. You can see examples of some of the larger Jerusalem artichokes. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. Massive, huh? Oh, nice. Just when you think you get all of them out, they'll creep back up because there's always some that you missed. Oh, look at that. Just abundant, yeah. abundant food. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, Brian, thanks so much for sharing all this with us. Well, and, my pleasure uh, to do so. What a joy, what yeah. a joy. And, and uh, absolutely beautiful. And folks, wherever you are, as our uh, friend and board member Brad Lidge likes to say, whatever your lot, wherever your plot, plant something, get growing, and uh, get that compost going too. That's right. And uh, as far as any calls to action you might have for our audience, Brian, what would you like to leave us with? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe two things. One is, I think sometimes, I think it was Immanuel Kant that said, uh, any moral act, in order to be moral, you can't derive any benefit from it, hmm. which I think is a lie, right? So sometimes in conservation circles, there's the sense that like we're doing the right thing and it's got to be hard. We're doing the right thing and so it's got to be hard. Yeah. I think, I think again, sometimes we listen to the wrong philosophers. Right. I have found that oftentimes to do the right thing, it's a blessing and it's a joy to do it, yes. right? So, so one, just, yeah, engage in good and redemptive activity with joy, right? And, and the second thing is um, do, do what you love to do, right? I, I'm doing this because I love to do it, not because of any other reason. So I, yeah, start small. Um, this is 3.7 acres, which in the grand scope of things is nothing, but it's making a big difference for me and for my family. I think it's making some small difference, but if a whole bunch of people would begin to do things that they loved to do that were in some way like this, then uh, then I think some things would start to change. The, the, the needle would begin to move because we need the needle to move. Love this. So what I'm hearing is we get to choose to conspire in our various places and help create God's garden. Absolutely. He made us as co-creators and said, go do it. Have fun. Have fun. And go do it. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Brian. Thanks, Aaron. It's been a joy yeah. visiting with Great you. Great to be with you. All right. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code whyonearth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.